Okay. Okay. And your team came prepared, so they're, yes. they're ready. Well, we're ready to hire, right? I am the captain of West Campus. So this is a very, very special day. This is the first time that we're going to have a Mike B. Fernandez Global Business Leadership Series event not held on the Wolfson campus. This is significant because that the Idea Center is expanding. So we have the Idea Center here at the West Campus, but we have the functionality of the Idea Center here at the West Campus. And I think it's very fitting because we like to think that we are a campus of ideas. And you are present today in what we call West Park. So this space, allows you to play dominoes, game, seek tutoring in mathematics, go to a physics class, go to mental health counseling, go to the food bank, go to MDC Works and get a job, go over to Veterans Center, all of this in the same fluid space because it creates community. So, but it is also a very special day because we get to hear from two visionary leaders. And I thought this morning, now, what does education and the cruise line industry, what do they have in common? And I thought, experience, actually. The student experience. One of Miami-Dade's strategic goals is reimagining the student experience. And the cruise line industry spends, I'm sure, countless 24 seven hours thinking about what is the cruise experience so do you come to college for knowledge yes we have michelin star faculty but it's not just about getting knowledge it's about feeling a sense of belonging carnival has vip members west we have you're all vips right <laughs> vip west so there's a lot of similarity because caring is really important. A sense of play, a sense of whimsy, but mostly a sense of purpose. So now let me turn it over to someone who is just a dream to collaborate with, and that is Alejandro, Executive Director of the Idea Center. It, it really is an, a pleasure to work together with Beverly and the entire team at West Campus. Please give all of them a hand of applause because it wouldn't have been possible without your leadership and without the entire team here who works with us. Can we hear our students, please? Our students in the audience, give it up. Come on. There we go. That's the type of energy that we bring to the programming that we do. We do it for you. We do it because we believe in you and we do it because we want you to have access and we want you to really engage with folks who are leading in industry and who are being entrepreneurial in so many ways. So I hope that you have an opportunity to network amongst each other. But there are many community members here, including our vice mayor of Doral. Please engage with our community members. Use this as an opportunity to grow and continue expanding your network without our benefactor, this series would not be possible. And we're very glad that Mike Fernandez has joined us here today. Mike, I'm going to embarrass you. I know you're, all, you're on the back, but if you could please stand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For believing in Miami-Dade College, but most of all, for believing in our students. I started this role about a year ago, and I went to every single campus, and I told you, that we were gonna do programming in your campuses. This is an example of that. We've continued to do it, and I'm excited to continue expanding the Idea Center into all of Miami-Dade College with the amazing team that we have. So to the team at the Idea Center, thank you for all that you do every day to make sure that we can serve our students well. And to our faculty members here, thank you for every day inspiring your students to dream big, for bringing them to these experiences. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our college president, Madeline Pumariega, and to the C, the president of Carnival Cruise Line, Christine Duffin.
Um, what a great day to be at West. It's always a great day to be at West um, Campus, but today is special because of what Alejandro said and what Beverly said, right? I think that we create these spaces to make sure that we enrich your experiences, not just for our students, but our entire team. And I have to say that I just whispered to Christine how special it is to watch our team in action um, and do the things that they love doing it with such purpose and passion. And I wanna make sure that I also let you know that in the room is our provost and executive vice president, Dr. Malusi Harrison. <laughs> Along with our campus presidents join us, and I want to introduce Claudia Puig from Univision as well, and a trustee at FIU, and to the vice mayor of Doral, to everyone joining us today, thank you so much. But I'm going to turn the spotlight on you, because we have these fireside chats. Really, um, I won't ask you the corporate questions, <laughs> right? We could probably Google or chat GPT, anything we want to know about Carnival, <laughs> right? But what we want to know is about you, Christine, about your journey. And so, um, you know, a little while ago we met with a few students that are working in our offices. Um, you know, you said how you started from the very bottom at Carnival. I did at the college. Um, we talked about my first job was McDonald's, but I started at the college as a part-time advisor um, and then went up. And so many of you at the college are work part-time and are looking for that full-time job. And so talk about your pathway to really the flagship um, Carnival Cruise Lines. How do you become president and CEO? Now for eight years, today's your anniversary yes. on Groundhog yes. Day. <laughs> so we, we want you to triple those numbers, but just about your journey um, to, to arriving to this position. Well, as you said, today is eight years and it literally felt like Groundhog Day when I found out that I got the job because I didn't grow up at Carnival. I did start at the bottom um, working at a travel agency as a receptionist when I was turned down for a job as a Pan American flight attendant because I was too short. <laughs> and so I didn't go to but, college. You know, flight attendants then. How many of you know Pan American? None of our students Pan do. Pan Am, there was Pan that Am, TV show, you know, TWA. We're, we're, we're tall, right? It was, a great, it, was, <laughs> it was really, that was my dream, to be a flight attendant, uh, to travel the world. Uh, my mother and family are uh, from France, so I did have the opportunity as a young girl to be able to travel, and that was my dream. And then my dream was completely shot because <laughs> I wasn't tall enough. But I did make it to the final interviews. Now I could have given you a little bit of my I, I, height. Yeah, you know, right, I, right, we could <laughs> trade. Well, cause somebody else told me they didn't make it because they were too tall. So I, I, you know, I guess I guess it works both ways. So. That's why I started as a receptionist. I thought, well, if I can't be a flight attendant, I'm going to be in the travel industry. I got a job at Rosenbluth Travel in Philadelphia, which is where I grew up, and literally uh, worked there, and then uh, worked at another agency where I ultimately became president at, at over 20 years. So it took a long time. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we were acquired by another company in St. Louis, and. Shortly after that, I was appointed as the first female president at Maritz Travel Company. And Maritz runs the largest corporate meetings, events, and incentive programs. And they had been in business for 110 years. And when I showed up in St. Louis, it was really like Dorothy just <laughs> coming into Fenton, Missouri. And someone actually said, you know, we bought your company. We don't know what you're doing here. So that was my introduction. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> so, but welcome. But I stayed there for um, a good eight years and then had the opportunity to um, be very involved, get involved in politics in Washington because in 2008, when the financial meltdown happened and President Obama said people shouldn't be taking trips to Las Vegas, that really shut down our business and many many jobs were lost and we went on a campaign to explain that the travel and tourism industry is a direct generator of jobs both indirect and direct economic impact across every congressional district in the country and i showed up in washington dc and i was going on the hill to meet and make sure they understood and someone said 
you know, you just can't show up here when there, you've got a problem. Like, where, where, have you, where have you and your industry been all this time? And they were right. So I became very involved in the U.S. Travel Association, and I'm very pleased. Uh, this year, I finished my term as chair. I serve on the um, Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, um, on her Travel and Tourism Advisory Board, and in the recent omnibus bill, we will have the first ever undersecretary of travel and tourism in this country. Can you believe we have never had that position? Every other country has someone that is focused on travel and tourism as part of the administration. So that's a long way of saying I went from Maritz to run the trade association for the global cruise industry. Um, when they saw what a great job I did in Washington, uh, we ultimately met with President Obama. And uh, President Obama listened, understood, and then we created Brand USA, which was the first public-private um, corporation to promote travel to the U.S. International inbound, which is a huge, huge part uh, of the travel uh, business here in the U.S. Uh, and so I was recruited to run the Cruise Industry Association globally. And uh, the industry at that time, unfortunately, had some very public incidents, crises, uh, and um, as a result of my work there, Mickey Arison, who is our chairman, uh, and uh, the vice chairman, Howard Frank, um, suggested that I would be great to be president of Carnival Cruise Line. <laughs> and when they said that to me, um, I thought they were talking to someone else because surely I'm not tall enough. <laughs> but to I, am, the world, I, right? am, I am the first woman president of Carnival Cruise Line, which is our flagship brand. And I am very, very proud to represent 40,000 Carnival Cruise Line employees. Carnival Cruise Line is the most popular cruise line in the world. So, wow. Very so I have a lot of places I want to jump yes. from there, right? And especially for context around our students about when you have a dream and a passion, it may not look as linear as you have in mind. But how, do you, how then do you follow the wandering road without getting discouraged, right? So you went down this other path. And when you were sitting at, you know, and you were leading the industry, um, and you said you were quite surprised with Mickey Arison. What did you think would be that next move? Did you ever see yourself as president at Carnival? And how do you think your leadership, I get this question all the time. And I try never to ask women the question because <laughs> I just wonder why do they ask? But then I know kind of why they ask. I was the first chancellor of our system, very much similar to the being an advocate in Tallahassee for the 28 state colleges. I don't necessarily think I was thinking I was going to be president of Miami-Dade College, nor did I do it because I thought I would be president of Miami-Dade College. Then asked by a few to come back home and lead the college who had gone through some, some very public um, issues on a presidential search. You kind of say, are you sure it's me? I was a student there. I played <laughs> basketball there. I started as an advisor, you know. Um, but how does your leadership style, how, how much has being the first woman influence your vision for Carnival and the way that you lead and what makes it different when we're the first um, to be that? And I always say I'm the first, but to the ladies out there, I want to make sure I'm not the last, um, that there's you know, far more capable women that follow um, as president of Miami-Dade College one day? Well, it's certainly, um, you know, you take it to heart that you are the first woman and that you're representing women. Um, at the same time, earlier in my career, I was um, very active outside of the company in other associations and uh, that supported the industry. And it was always fascinating to me because the majority of people that work in travel and hospitality are women. And yet, very few women hold the top jobs. And I remember going to uh, one of our board meetings and I, I, I was pitching this idea of creating a women's leadership initiative where we would provide research and scholarships and networking opportunities so that we could see more women that would reflect actually the workforce. 
And I remember one of the gentlemen in the room saying to me, why would we need more women? There are already so many women working. <laughs> And, and it was just struck me like they, he actually did not internalize the fact that there were very few women at leadership. And it was another gentleman who became a lifelong friend who had four daughters. And he at the time was uh, president of Wyndham Hotels. And they wrote me a check for $300,000 because he said, I want my daughters to know that they can have a seat at this table. Now, of course, in that meeting, I was the only woman. <laughs> but we did get our initiative going, and so I've always felt a responsibility, like I'm sure you do. When you're the only woman in the room, or the first woman, um, we do have a responsibility to make sure that we're bringing others along. But I think today, it's not only women. It's not just gender. It's this idea that diversity, inclusion, bringing everyone along actually makes us better. It makes our business better, it makes society better, it makes our communities better. And so for me, um, having you know, 32,000 crew members um, from all over the world, over 110 countries, um, spending time with them, listening to them, uh, and we very much focus now on how do we create a career path for people who join Carnival on the ships that actually now are coming and working shoreside. Because again, it's this diversity of thinking. We also still hire a lot of people, as I was saying to the students earlier, former McKinsey consultants and Boston Consulting Group consultants, people that have been at Carnival for 30 years. I think it's the mix of all of us that have enabled us to be so successful and to create a great culture. That's awesome. We um, at Miami-Dade College think talent is universal, opportunity is not. And as Democracies College, what we build is opportunity for our students. Um, and we understand that through the power of education, you get on that path. Um, I wanted to ask you, how much were you able to influence? We know what happened during COVID. Um, we know really the cruise lines were of all of the industries. Um, I can't think ever that, or could you have ever imagined that your industry would be just shut down to zero. Um, how much did you use that experience as being an advocate in DC for the industry, right? For the association, the, the relationships that you built, the importance of who you could call right away to understand and make the case. And I say this all the time, how important it is for leaders um, to focus on relationships and that connection, never to be in, in such a hurry that you forget to build the relationships. How much did you rely on those relationships you established to help navigate not just Carnival Cruise Lines, but really the whole um, industry and how influential was that for you and, and um, impactful? Well, as you said, it's incredibly important. And it's one of the things I do talk a lot about for our own employees and, and for an audience like this. You know, people tend to, you know, you have your job, you keep your head down, you do your work, and you assume that people actually understand what you do. Now, whether that's, you know, your boss's boss or whether that's a regulator sitting in Washington or somebody sitting at the International Maritime Organization in London. So it's part of our job to ensure that we communicate clearly with data why what we do matters. And I believe that those relationships and networks both inside of your company and your business, but also outside, you have to really think about who are all the stakeholders. And for me in this role, I've got a lot of stakeholders that you know, every state in, that we operate in, every country, we have ships in Australia, you have to visit. You can't just show up when you have a problem, like I did back in 2008, and think <laughs> that people are going to put you at the top of the list. We obviously were very, very challenged by CDC and the way that the cruise industry was singled out from every other industry, particularly as we as we saw things starting to open up and with the protocols and all of the all of the things that we do on a ship that protect public health and medical 
Um, it was it was it was tough, but the relationship that I had with Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo, the relationships with U.S. Travel Association, with members of Congress. We just recently visited earlier this week with a member of Congress, the mayor here, Daniela Caba, that we work closely with as part of Restart. These. And, and the great thing about travel and tourism, and I think, it, is that it really is a bipartisan issue. They're, they're really, people across both sides of the aisle understand, appreciate, and recognize the benefit and value of travel, tourism, and the jobs that it creates um, for all levels of, of the community, so. I mean, it's economic development, right? And, and Florida, without a doubt, our sunshine and our weather today, if you saw the news today, you don't want to be in Texas. And this weekend, you don't want to be in the Northeast. You want to be right here in Florida. And so we rely so much on it. So it's not only the impact that it had as you were working with the mayor um, on just a direct cruise line and carnival it was the entire community because this community's economic development and prosperity relies so much on uh travel and, and tourism and particularly not, not just miami but really all of florida and what you touched a little bit about culture and i wanted to ask you you know there's you know um in any leadership book um you'll read that culture will always trump strategy you can have the best strategy, you can have the best vision, but if you don't create the right culture in anything that you're leading, whether it's a student organization, a department, a college, a cruise line, or the President of the United States, the, the key of culture, um, how do you focus on culture? And what would you say if we asked um, the, the, your colleagues at Carnival and we said, what's Christie's main thing around <laughs> culture? What would they say? Well, I think um, they would say that I've changed the culture. You know, I believe you need different leaders for different times. My predecessor had been the CFO of Carnival Corporation uh, for 13 years before he stepped into this job. And at that time, he had to do a lot of things that were difficult and drive a lot of change. And so I was able to step in at a time where the company recognized it needed a different face it needed someone that could communicate and take the company to the next place. And for me, based on my background, that was really leaning into our people and culture. And I tell this story of when I first started um, on February 2nd, 2015. <laughs> I, you know, my original office at Doral was, I mean, I, it was bigger than the condo that I was living in. And I had this gigantic desk and my feet didn't even touch the ground. And, and, and there were glass doors with two assistants sitting outside and they would bring me breakfast on a tray in the morning. And I felt like I was like trapped. <laughs> And people would come in with PowerPoint presentations all day, you know, meeting after meeting. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I, how am I actually going to understand this business? I had the benefit of four years running the trade association. So I really understood the regulatory issues, the environmental, secure, I mean, all of that. So I decided that I was going to visit every one of our ships. At the time, we had 26 ships. And I, people thought I was crazy, but I said, no, I'm gonna go visit every ship. And I did in that first year, I visited every ship and I met with crew members at all levels and I asked them three questions. What was working well? What was not working? And if they were me, what would they be doing? And I'll tell you what, I learned more in that year than I could have learned in five years if I had sat in the office. So my big focus for all of us is to get out there and touch the people that touch the customer, spend time with the customer, because you do have to, yes, look at the data. We do need to lean into people that are, are developing you know, future innovation and technology, but we have to understand and connect what does all of that strategy actually mean? What does it look like? How do you execute effectively? Because if you don't execute and have the people that you're communicating with, for them to understand why we're making the decisions we're making, because sometimes we do have to make unpopular decisions, how we keep people engaged, how they are part of and feel that they are included, 
uh, to me makes all the difference. And Carnival Cruise Line over the past eight years, with the exception of COVID, we have had the best years in the history, 50 year history of our company. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. So true to building the culture um, alongside the strategy. And then if you build the right culture alongside the strategy, then you can execute on it. Because as leaders, we know there's no way we're the single point of execution. The reality is, is that the vision gets ex executed out by everyone. Um, for here at the college, our focus has been a culture of care, is making sure that, that, our, that our, it starts with our team feeling that they are nurtured and cared for here at the institution. If they feel that, then we know our students are going to feel that wherever they are, whether it's a classroom or an office, and just focusing on that. And to the students, um, I'll say, how do you build culture? Um, is culture is built by what you reward, what you recognize, what you celebrate, but it's also behavior that you accept as the norm when it doesn't align to values. And so a lot of times people ask, what is culture? And culture is really sat in the, in the fabric of behaviors of, a, of an institution, of an organization, and what's celebrated and, quite frankly, what's also well, allowed. Well, it, it, and it's interesting because I do think and it warms my heart even to listen, Beverly, as you, were, as you were talking earlier, and to hear more and more leaders and comp I mean, that, that expression of, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast has been around a long time. I don't actually believe that corporations were operating with that, that way. I think we have seen a real shift where walking the talk and leaning into culture and creating trust is actually mandatory because I don't believe this next generation, and that's this group of students, will tolerate anything less than that. And so I think we're just hearing every industry talking about experience. I get phone calls all the time because, as you were saying, you know, we are in the guest experience business. You know, we don't have a business if our guests aren't happy. And my view is if my crew isn't happy, my guests aren't going to be happy. But health care, um, colleges, educate, everybody is trying to figure out how do we improve experience for our employees. And, and I think that's, that's so great right now. The, some of the harder part is what you said, making decisions when leaders don't, walk the talk how do we respond and you know just this year we've had uh, several cases people that were long-term tenured employees leaders that were separated from the company because one of our culture values is speaking up without fear and that we as leaders listen and learn and I think those tough decisions, right? It's, it's easy to talk the talk, but when you have a great performer, and we talk about people's technical capabilities today, but what is their integrity? What, what is their, how do they do their work? At Carnival, what we've now implemented is your performance, manage, you know, performance at the end of the year, 50% is evaluated on what you get done you know, the, the business objectives. The other 50% is how do you get your work done? How do you engage with colleagues? How do you operate as part of a team? And that's really a pretty big shift from what I would say the norm was when I started in my career a very long time ago where it was only about business results and whatever means to the end that was okay. And so I think for all of you that are going to be entering the workforce, this is a great new time um, where you should expect that culture and how leaders treat their employees and walk the talk against the values um, is, is a paramount decision to where you ultimately spend your time and, and your work. Without a doubt, I think, <clears throat> first of all, you see there's probably four generations um, in this room. And for any leader right now, you're leading four, if not five generations. And so, you know, if I said 
NASA, everyone would have a different thought here, right? If you're in our generation, we probably think of the Challenger, yeah. the anniversary that just happened. For some, it's like, what is the Challenger? Mm -hmm. For us, we can probably tell you exactly where we were yes. standing when that happened, right? Um, and if we were thinking about another generation, they're thinking about the day man walked on the moon, mm -hmm. right? And so um, that's the part, the aspect that as leaders being students of our trade is that we now lead multi-generations in our organization and, and um, the importance of, of being able to give them that sense of, the, of belonging that they too can impart their values and their kind of fingerprints, if you will, on our organizations. I'm going to ask you one question. We're going to turn to other questions because I read this and I kind of didn't believe you because <laughs> I was like, are you sure, Alejandro, Amanda, everybody? Because um, when I was chancellor and you work in the Department of Education, there's like not a lot of happiness inside government, I promise you. <laughs> and <clears throat> I hired someone and I said, look you know her title was this real technical title but I really said she was the chief happiness officer and I said if I could really name you something is you're like the chief happiness officer and she's still a, a great friend and you have a chief fun yes. officer tell us about <laughs> the chief fun officer <laughs> Well, you know, Carnival is all about fun, and Ted Arison's visit, vision when he started Carnival was back then, cruising was for the elite. You know, it was for the privileged. It was very expensive, and there was first class and second class, and, and he believed that every American should be able to afford a fun vacation. And so Carnival was always about fun and being a great value affordable, creating memorable vacations for everyone. And so when I came, um, you know, I wanted to lean into who we were, but put, of course, our own mark. So that was where we came up with choose fun as sort of this verb, like action, we're going to choose fun with Carnival. And then we said, okay, who can we get that embodies fun that everyone knows and who happened to play for the Miami Heat and is larger than life. He couldn't have been a flight attendant either. No. <laughs> our, our, our chief fun officer, Shaq O'Neal. And <laughs> I had to read and yeah. call and be like, for real, where, where did I miss that Shaq yes. um, is the chief fun officer for Carnival. So yes. I, I, I love that, I yes. love that. Um, Alejandro, I think some um, questions I wanna make sure we don't monopolize um, anybody coming up for questions. Hi, my name is Manny Sarmiento, President and uh, CEO of Doral Chamber of Commerce, and we like fun. We create that culture, too. We take care of our employees. So when we bring someone in, interns, uh, Marilyn, I need interns for the summer. When we bring interns in, we teach them the culture, and we make sure that we educate them in, in the real practice of real life, because being here is different than when you get out there. Uh, <laughs> We do the event thanks to you on Carnival, which we're hoping to get back to in the spring here, where we go and have and we take our business leaders on the ship, and we we have a we have a great speaker like uh, Mayor Suarez. Uh, uh, now we hopefully we're getting Mayor Mayor Fraga, our great new mayor of the city of Doral. First female mayor in Doral. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Christy right. Fraga, we're proud right. of her. And uh, so um, mostly, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for supporting the community. But I want to I want to thank you, and I want to I, I do really want to relay that uh, the culture, and not just the culture internally, and you can see that uh, Calvin is is a representative. It was it was um, the other gentleman. Uh, it's so amazing, and we go on the ship, and the, you know, even though they're working overtime, they they dance on the tables for us and stuff during that lunch. It's an amazing event. Uh, we were really pushing to get that back. We lost it during COVID, of course. But uh, how do you, what's your mentality about that, about the community? How is it that, you know, you can find it in yours and then you try to call someone for service and you have to go through 15 prompts to get someone and you guys are still answering the phone like we do. Well, how, do you, how do you get that instilled in this day where people are still blaming COVID for that? Well, it, it's been a long, long journey out of where we were and, and there have been moments where you couldn't get through on our phones either. So, but I, I think it's about what is our intention, right? And how are we supporting our employees? Because like many companies, we didn't have 
enough workers in the office. We were able to bring back people on the ship, but then we ran into challenges where, again, our relationships with State Department helped because we couldn't get visas for the crew members we were bringing back as we were restarting ships. And working with the U.S. State Department, uh, they made it possible for our crew members who normally would have to go for their in-person interviews in their home country to come to the Bahamas um, and, and do their processing there. So, you know, you have to be creative. I mean, we've, we've all lived through something that will be talked about 100 years from now. Uh, and, and we did things that we never could have imagined, as you said. It was never in the scenario plan uh, that we would be shut down, for, <laughs> that our entire business would be <laughs> shut down for 16 months. Um, it but it we just were. really is, is amazing, right? It, right? Get, you, I think about when we read, when there's the case studies of what we've gone through, you know, as a world in the last two years and the resiliency. I think resiliency around leadership, resiliency of companies, resiliency of people. Um, and it will be, I think, in the history books uh, beyond the science and everything else. And w certainly the lives lost will be, I think, the resiliency of a nation and of a world to bounce back. And I think bounce back with a stronger focus on caring for one another, a stronger focus for experience, a stronger f focus for that person-to-person -person kind of um, connection, which I think it was easy and might have been getting lost in our you know, digital um, connectivity is the human connectivity. I want to make sure um, if one of our students, we see our presidential scholars are right here. Um, if you've got another question, Alejandro. Hi, everyone. My name is Gladys Masrahi from the Power of the Heels Foundation. And my question to you on a women in a top leadership position, what are the changes that you've been able to make to close the gender gap? You know, I think we, we didn't have a gender gap in terms of the numbers of people we had. It's really more about bringing a focus to all people. How? At, for people who want to do new and different things, I, I've often said, and I think you, you said, you know, my career to get here is was not some, a, a linear path. It was not traditional. One of the things I've encouraged, not just for women, but of everyone, is consider taking jobs that are maybe parallel. Everyone seems to get very fixated on how I move up the ladder, what's, what, you know, I don't want to do that job unless I'm going to get a uh, title promotion. Um, to me, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't made some decisions along the way that some people thought was kind of backwards. Like, why did I leave Maritz, where I was CEO, to take a job running the Cruise Industry Trade Association? Well, if I hadn't done that, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here. So I think it is important to not think about career path the way we may have done the historically, and to think about we're bringing more and more people off of the ships who are coming to work in, in Doral, in office jobs. We've just opened an office in Manila, in the Philippines, to give our Filipino crew members a career path that ultimately, for those that want to get off the ships and, and live at home, they can do that again. That's, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, when we think about just education, I would say six, we know that across the country, 60% of students are women. But if you think about female presidents, it's at 27%, 28%. So, you know, we see those gaps. And one of the things we've done here at the college is launched a presidential leadership academy. And I spend a year with about 55 of our leaders on a monthly basis reading books, talking about leadership and talking about strategy. Because I think we can't do enough of the mentoring aspect and of the opportunity. And then I would just say that our president's cabinet to the guys, sorry, is majority women, but um, to the men in the room, I want to say that it's not, it, for me, it's about making sure that we create a culture of opportunity for everyone, that everyone has an opportunity that if you keep learning, if you keep strategizing, if you keep executing, that there's going to be an opportunity for you. Because 
we're short on talent. I don't think we're short on people. We're really short on building capacity and talent, whether it's the travel and tourism industry, whether it's the tech, whether it's television. Anywhere we talk to workforce leaders and CEOs, they want the most talented person. And I think that that's the important part, is that we're in a place where we build talent, and as leaders, we build that within our, our, our institutions and capacity. Go ahead for the next question. Hi, um, my name is Zachary. So you talked about your jump up to president, and you said you started from the bottom. Um, what was your train of thought going from you know working in the travel agency to going to president? Like, did you wake up like, wait, I'm president of a company? Like, <laughs> how, how did that get? How did that happen? Like, what was your what was your train of thought? throughout the process. That, that, that pretty well describes it. <laughs> I, you know, when I, when I worked, I worked at the agency in, in Philadelphia for 20 years and ultimately became president. So for that, it was, you know, a growing opportunity. We were a small business, very entrepreneurial. We got uh, into another business that we grew. But clearly, going from where I had been to Carnival, right, this was a, you know, Fortune 500 public company and it was it was definitely um very intimidating especially because when i started within six months the entire leadership team had resigned by that you know it, like i started in two weeks in the head they, of operations left left, <laughs> and then the cfo and then the head of hr well i, I don't want to blame myself too much because my predecessor announced he was leaving you know, six months before I started. So I think clearly some of them had already been decided that if they weren't getting my job, they weren't staying. And there were many nights, and I moved to Miami, so I wasn't, I'm not from Miami. I remember lying in bed, not sleeping, thinking, oh my gosh, what are the, what is Mickey thinking? They're gonna, like, <laughs> everybody's sleeping. But, you know, you take a breath, and you realize that, okay, this is actually an opportunity for me to build my own team. And there was a lot of talent in the organization that I was able to promote and restructure and brought some people in from outside. And as you said, even with four generations, that's all just more diversity, right? Um, and so here I am eight years later, but you're right. That is what I, I thought. Oh, wow. Are they really talking to me? <laughs> You know, I have those moments. Yeah. <laughs> I would like somebody will introduce me. I'm like, I'm the president of this college. I went right. to this college well, yeah. like, as I was a right. student at this college. You know, yeah. Like, yeah, OK, OK. But um, just shows that anything is possible. That's right, right? right. Next. Um, hello again. Hi, I was again. just acquainted with you in the Ideal Center. Um, thank you so much for coming today. I just want to know, um, I know you're the first female president of Carnival, and I'm pretty sure you faced a lot of discriminatory issues to get to where you are. Um, what advice would you have for students who might face the same, and how would you be able to motivate them to still achieve their goals even after facing such discriminatory? Well, as you said, I mean, especially of my age and generation, it was a different time when I started working, and I was often the only woman, and I traveled a lot. We ran large events for pharmaceutical companies, automotive companies, and being on the road and, you know, people go on the road and they turn into very different people than when I met them in the office. Um, and, you know, I, I, I remember Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, and I remember um, having to deal with those issues personally and making the decision to escalate, even though there were some in my company that thought, well, you know, they're a really big client. Do you really think that's it? But it goes back to this having the courage. If these are our values, and if this is what we know to be right, then we know it makes it, yes, it's hard, because there's always fear that someone wasn't going to believe me or someone was, you know, we were going to lose this big account. At the end of the day, we didn't lose the big account and that person lost their job and we, but, but others knew that I had stood up. And so, you know, my, my advice is you have to follow your own true north. And that has, no matter how hard that's been sometimes, it really has 
allowed me to sleep at night to know at least I did the right thing, what I believe was the right thing. Um, maybe it's not popular, um, but maybe if you're in an organization or a climate that uh, is going to allow that, then that's what you need to make a change. Good morning, my name's Halima. Um, earlier you mentioned that you had a dream of becoming a flight attendant and that dream was cut short. So what inspired you to aim for higher? Like what told you you could do this? That's not the end of the world. Uh, well, I, I didn't know I could do this. Be and, and so literally, all, when I didn't get the flight attendant job, I just knew I wanted to be in the travel industry and starting out as the receptionist, I really didn't, I, I didn't set my sight to be where I have gotten You just today. thought you'd get a couple of free discounted, some you know, some, some uh, travel but, uh, vouchers. Right, <laughs> but as I got into it, I was good at managing people. I was very entrepreneurial. I was able to, to really rise, and I love being in business and being with people and communicating. I was very much on the sales and marketing and commercial side. Um, and so it, I go back to sometimes I talk to our younger employees who have this goal and if they don't achieve this specific job or title by this date, then somehow they feel they failed or that they're running out of time and they're not even 30. Uh, and, and, and so I really think you have to own where you are now without worrying about does, you know, yes, you want to think about maybe this leads me to the place I want to go. And it's good to have a goal and it's good to have a vision, but don't let that stand in the way of paying attention to where you are in this moment and letting opportunities come to you. I mean, when those opportunities come, then you have a choice. Do I jump in? even when it's unknown or when it's taking that parallel path when I left Maritz to go run this cruise industry <laughs> association, only you can decide. But, but really own the job that you have today. And I think, I think we put a lot of pressure on our kids. I, I do too. I think that's great advice about um, owning where you are and then growing where you are. Um, sometimes you might not grow in a title, but the opportunity gives you time to grow as a person or to grow as a leader um, and be prepared when that opportunity comes. We'll land in for the last question now. So we've got one more and then we'll wrap it up. All right, hi, my name is Ashley Varela. Um, you had mentioned culture, right? And I personally think, and I feel like a lot of people know that diversity can be very difficult, but you say that you're very good at managing people. So how do you manage people? Um, of many different walks. How do you help them work together? Are you meticulous with how you choose people that come into your team? Um, I had the question of, do you allow them to, or do you pick people that fit a certain standard, or do you pick people that are different, difficult to work with, yet you see the potential in them? How do you well, think about that? <laughs> Well, I think that first is I do have people that are very different from me, right? Because I think that is what diversity and different backgrounds, different experiences, different skills. I did not go to college. And I have our chief commercial officer went to MIT. Our chief financial officer went to, his father was a professor at, uh, I think, uh, in one of the Stanford or yeah one of the you know another guy did go to Stanford was a BCG consultant so but we made a great team because guess what I always brought up things that they hadn't thought about and I always made them do things they didn't want to do I mean <laughs> my god those guys were were really uncomfortable communicate like having to like well why do we have to tell people that <laughs> Well, Can't we just send them the PowerPoint? It, it, literally, <laughs> lit I mean, Isabella is here. Isabella works with me and my my team, and and we are very different. Uh, but I think that's what really makes us successful. We we come at things differently. I could never do what they do. Um, but they can't do what I do either. So it makes for a good team. And I think that's really the key to diversity is how do you take people 
uh, and make a team. Because I don't, it's never about one person. It's never about the single leader. It's about the people they surround themselves with. And then how does that cascade into the organization? So everyone in the organization can see themselves in someone. Yeah, and I would just add diversity of thought. Yeah. I think that when we think about diversity, not just the diversity of the people around us, but the diversity of how people think around us and leaving a space where that empathy and understanding can happen um, because then that really does bridge um, those gaps that might separate us is when you, when you can sit quiet enough and see the lens in which someone is thinking something that is completely different than the way you do or the way that you see it and not make it right or wrong and not polarize it, but just build on it on how it can unite us. So I wanna leave you with the last word and I want, um, thank you, that was amazing yeah. and so thoughtful of your questions. Um, I want just to share your vision for Carnival and, and what we should expect uh, from your leadership and your team and, and what you're most excited about. Well, as I was sharing with the group earlier, um, we are taking an 11% capacity increase at Carnival. So we actually have three ships um, with Carnival Celebration that was delivered here in Miami. Uh, in December, we have Carnival Venezia that's coming. She'll be in New York year round. And then our third Excel ship, Jubilee, which will be in Galveston, Texas. For Celebration, we actually, uh, these are LNG ships. So we have Mardi Gras at Port Canaveral. So these are the first liquefied natural gas propulsion ships in the Americas. Um, and so we are really reducing our carbon footprint. Um, we are investing in shore power. So here in Miami, we will have shore power where the ships will actually plug into the electrical grid as opposed to when we're running alongside um, using fuel. We've also removed a significant amount of single-use plastics from the ship and uh, Mayor Kava has a certification that I think we've well exceeded. Um, I, what's an up two million or what did we remove Kelly from? We removed 90% of 90% of single-use single plastics, plastics have been removed from <laughs> Carnival cruise ships and our plastic water bottles are actually tracked and all recycled. Um, we are reducing food waste. We've installed, even during the pandemic, we've installed over 600 food digesters. And so these are machines on the ships that take and all of the, any food that's left is put into this machine and there's an organism inside the machine and it eats all of the food waste and you're left with a bottle about this big of effluent that is wow. then disposed of properly. Um, and so we're very, very committed and focused on the environment. Every Carnival cruise ship has an environmental officer. We also have a public health officer on every ship. So I'm really proud of the work and commitment that we have at Carnival, across Carnival Corporation and our other brands to really be more sustainable and to, to lean into the technologies that exist, fuel cell, hydrogen. There's a lot of research and development. There's a lot of enablement with technology that reduces paper. We've reduced a significant amount of paper that used to be issued on the ships. We've worked with customs board CBP, facial recognition to help with embarkation. Uh, there's a lot of technology now that enables every business, including ours, so there's a big investments. And uh, in 2024, we'll take on another close to 14% capacity. So Carnival Cruise Line um, is growing. Uh, we are thrilled to have every ship back in our fleet. We were the first cruise line to have every ship back in the fleet. And I'm really proud of the team. We are sailing at over 100% occupancies. Wow. Congratu congratulations um, to you and to the entire Carnival team. Um, we wish you the very best and um, we want to thank you for spending your time um, with us and with our students and our team here and count on us to be a great partner and to be a great neighbor um, and continue to do collaborations together. So thank you well, so thank very you much. Thank you and congratulations to you too <laughs> for you, being the first. And I think we have our Carnival recruiters here. So if anyone wants to learn more about Carnival and the opportunities that we have, right? Yeah, you know. <laughs>
please stop by. But thank you so much for having me. It was a real thrill and uh, so amazing to hear the stories and meet your students in this idea center. Just incredible. Really thank you so wonderful. much. And to Alejandro, thank you. Beverly, thank you. And everyone, thanks. The quality of speakers that, that, that come to the uh, to the series, uh, and um, it had always been downtown. This is the first time that it uh, that it takes place in, in the Doral location. Uh, and it's, I think it's fantastic to be able to stretch its wings uh, and touch it with people.